Hey folks, Scott Holly with you again, and uh, I'm in kind of a stripped down budget spaceship today because we've been going on a long journey. Firefox wanted to see this uh, landmark, it's called the Grumpy Cat Nebula, and uh, oh, we've just arrived. So if we look out the port window, um, I think, yep, we're coming up on it. Take a look over here oh i gotta switch to the other camera um look at oh <laughs> look at that isn't that amazing yeah see the detail and the the fine see some gas dynamics there it's a little lobby you know that's our geeky dan clip model but wow what a majestic piece of uh space stuff oh look i'm in front of the port window let me go back to the uh, control panel there there we are and so today we're gonna look at neural networks as curve fitters as function approximators and so to do that um, i'm gonna switch to share screen and then we'll pull up the brow yet yeah, you don't need to see that here we go all right so from our lessons we've now got this one number four n ends fit curves and we're going to open that in colab and i wanted to be sure this time to make sure that the font was big enough to see yeah and someone's probably wondering can we turn off the dark mode probably possible let's see if we can do that that would be in settings light mode I haven't used light mode in ages we'll see what happens okay yeah now everything's a lot brighter all right well hopefully you can see this we'll see how this goes and see how people like light versus dark mode as we go okay so we start off with just a bit of a uh reorientation we've been talking about deep learning and so what do we mean when we say deep learning, right? So deep learning is a machine learning approach to artificial intelligence. And in class today, we talked a little bit about how the, the stream of AI and the stream of ML kind of came from different places, even though nowadays people think they're all the same. Oh, I got a little feedback from, uh, even though the kitties are cute and someone's probably gonna be disappointed, no one will be more disappointed than me, but I will turn off kitty mode and yeah then there's nothing moving which maybe makes it more boring but we'll keep going all right um yeah so multiple layers we'll talk about what constitutes a layer in just a little bit artificial neurons they're trained we'll talk a bit about gradient descent and we're going to try to minimize a loss function also called a cost function so this uh word deep learning right it was it was recast for many years it was just neural networks and uh not uh, a lot of people were into neural networks and um, not a lot of people were convinced that they were going to be, uh, we're going to have a lot of big payoff. In fact, people have been working on neural networks for decades and it kind of wasn't taken super seriously. That says 200s. That's, uh, that's supposed to say 2000s. Why don't we, why don't we fix that while we're here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. They were coming to that. All right. Um, so yeah, Jeff Hinton coined that term, and we'll talk about what makes it deep. So we're gonna use multiple successive layers of neurons, right? And so machine learning, of course, this goes back to Arthur Samuels and uh, kind of different from the symbolic AI where we're programming things in. Instead with machine learning, we're, uh, we're optimizing a system's behavior, okay? And so curve fitting is a great example of that. And it turns out that, yeah, we're gonna be doing curve fitting. So when we think about what's in a neural network, so we started earlier with kind of a really top-down view of here's some things you can do with some uh, deep neural network systems. And then we started with uh, using a little bit of image recognition with fast AI. And we're gonna go down farther into what are the kind of the nuts and bolts. We're not gonna go completely uh, down to the uh, bare essentials, but we'll give kind of an overview and we can go deeper later on, right? So um, when we say artificial neural network, it's made of artificial neurons and wow, that picture is gigantic. 
think that's probably because I made the font so big. We're going to do adaptive font size here. I think it's a feature of uh, Colab that it just automatically scales images up to the total width. But this will work for now, right? So this is kind of a picture. So these two guys here together are kind of our artificial neuron. Where artificial neuron, it's just a weighted sum. So like this little summation symbol. Say we've got some input and it's got you know, different parts to it, like pixels in an image or uh, columns in like a spreadsheet. And we're just going to sum them up. But instead of just summing them, we're going to weight each of these by some different amount, right? And that'll be our weighted sum. And then we're going to smash it through some nonlinear activation function. I'll show you some examples of those. That's going to let us fit nonlinear things because we're going to, the activation function is going to have some kind of kink or curve to it. And that'll give us our output from our model or our prediction. And so based on when I learned numerical analysis and numerical modeling, uh, my professor tended to put a tilde on things from the model prediction, whereas things that were exact or ground truth target would not have the tilde. And so essentially um, with just one neuron, um, we can actually do some simple fitting. Like we could fit a line to some data. In fact, actually, if we got three of these numbers, we could uh, we could fit a plane to some data. But if you uh, block off one of these, you could have like one of these could be the y-intercept and one of these could be the slope of a line. And then we can define some loss function that's the difference between our data points and the predictions of the models, which in this case would be mean squared error. That's how we fit lines. So this is just one neuron, right? It's just a weighted sum. And then we jam it through some activation function that I'll show you in a bit. So what's the activation function? Well, there are a lot of different choices that we can use, and they go by different names. So I put in a little thingy here, and it looks like the, uh, you know what? Let me, uh, let me regenerate this because it looks like when I change the size of the system. Uh, okay, good, yeah. Uh, so this is a bunch of different graphs, and there are even more. You could Google activation functions, but something that's nonlinear. So actually, historically, the very first activation function that was ever used was a step function. It was just zero. Let's see, which way are you looking at this? Zero, and then one. But it was discontinuous, and that wasn't going to work out so well for training. So um, there's kind of a couple different ways you can turn a step function into something kind of continuous. One is this green line, this sigmoid, which goes from zero to one, and you can kind of adjust the slope of the, uh, the S shape and where the middle of that S shape is. And we'll look at that a little later when we look at logistic regression. Um, or you can, uh, the sigmoid and the hyperbolic tangent function, this red one, they're pretty much almost the same thing. One of them goes to zero, one of them goes to minus one, but really you can like, multiply sigmoid by two and like subtract one or something you got hyperbolic tangent so um those are kind of interesting because those are bounded um and then we've got a bunch of different things uh that people use that are sort of bounded by zero on one side and then approximate some kind of linear function and the simplest of these is the rectified linear u linear unit uh the relu right which is just a straight line x equals y slope of one for anything greater than zero, and then it's just exactly zero on the other side, right? And this is fast. It gets you sparse matrices and sparse activations, and it's ridiculously popular, even though uh, this is completely zero here. And this can actually, we'll talk about this a little more later on, this can actually cause dead neurons. Uh, so sometimes people don't want to set that all the way to zero. Sometimes you have what's called a leaky ReLU, where instead of going straight to zero, you've got your regular straight up activation here and then it's uh got some kind of small slope and if you want to see the code on these you can just click show code and then there's some other newer ones that people have been coming up with alu and prelu and um there are a bunch of different things that go by different names that have this kind of shape where it looks like the relu there but then it come kind of comes down a little bit and then it goes to zero one of them is called mish and uh some people have noticed some really good properties from this function or similar things. Interestingly, uh, all of these activation functions are what we call monotonic in that, or at least they're not, um, they're, okay, they're not necessarily, oh, pause, recording. Okay, they're never decreasing all of these, except MISH, 
will go down. It'll go down and then come up. But all these other ones either stay flat or they go up all the time. And um, But uh, the mesh goes down. Anyway, uh, some kind of choice of an activation function. All right. So I'm going to walk you through this pretty quickly. So that's just one neuron. Then we can put a whole bunch of neurons together. And so this is a really, really common, this is kind of the, the primordial uh, neural network that most people see and talk about. We call it a multi-layer perceptron or MLP. You've got some inputs. Sometimes we'll call that a layer, like an input layer. And you've got some outputs. We may call that an output layer. And we've got a hidden layer of neurons here. So actually, this hidden layer and the output are made up of these artificial neurons. And then the different inputs are connected to the different, I didn't draw a little individual neurons here, but they're connected through weights, just like before. So each of these little neurons has a weighted sum of what came before it. And I kind of drew some of these as thicker and, and thinner to kind of show that the weights could be different numbers and things. And we'll get into how this actually works. This is really, this is just going to be a simple matrix multiply. So the sum, and then we run them through some activation function, and that's kind of the output of the layer. And the same thing for the output of the neural network. We uh, will often do a, uh, a sum over those activations and then run that maybe through another activation or not. Kind of depends on what we're doing. And then we'll compare those with kind of what the expectation may be in a, say, so I'm using a supervised learning context here. And the measure of the similarity or dissimilarity is given by the loss function, which for today, we're just going to let it be mean squared error. So I'll define what that is. So this is just one layer. And then, yeah, so when I say layer, so actually layer really, um, we write all of these things as a sequence. And so sometimes we'll regard the weights as a layer. Sometimes we'll regard the activations as a layer. It's kind of a word that gets thrown around quite a bit. Now, as we start adding more and more of these hidden layers, and they can be taller or smaller. They can have more no neurons or fewer. Um, interestingly, usually we refer to the number of neurons as the width. So you can kind of think of this diagram as being turned on its side somehow. But here we've got two of these hidden layers. And we could add more and more and more and more. And that's the depth. So when we say deep neural networks, we're talking about systems with increasing layers feeding into layers feeding into layers. So um, this is still pretty shallow, actually. Um, this diagram, just because I didn't want to draw more. But we can definitely look at diagrams for some very, very deep neural networks as we go on. All right. And so they're fitting curves. And this is a particular kind of model. And so the model is going to be based on some combination of our activation functions placed in different places. All right. And it turns out that if we have just one hidden layer and we make it infinitely tall or have infinitely many neurons, there's this thing called the universal approximation theorem that says we can fit any function to any desired degree of accuracy just by kind of moving where all the different kinks from the different neuron activations are, right? I'm simplifying, but that's the idea. But it doesn't guarantee how to find those weights to make that happen. Not there at all. It's a purely theoretical result. And in practice, people find that instead of just making one hidden layer that's got tons of neurons, if we stack neurons feeding into neurons and layers feeding the layers, uh, it tends to train better. So that's kind of where this deep learning thing is really coming from. All right. So we're going to be fitting some kind of curve. I included this great comic from XKCD where he's got these data points. It's the same data points every single time but he's fitting different kinds of curves to it. And so it's curve fitting methods and the messages they say, right? So straight line, I did a regression. So when we say regression, that usually means we're fitting a line, but actually this would be a, all of these others, or most of these would be nonlinear regression. So regression is curve fitting, right? Quadratic, so it looks like everything's increasing. You can read through these and this is kind of hilarious. And what's also hilarious is how a lot of these look pretty plausible. Right? You're kind of looking at this like, yeah, I could totally believe it's exponential. I mean, we don't care about those points, right? And then you're like, oh, yeah, so no, this could be logistic. And then, yeah, we can do these things where we say, look, we're going to uh, plot a confidence interval, and we can learn about doing that. One thing we don't really want to do, we don't want to try to extrapolate too much. In many cases, our neural networks aren't going to extrapolate very well. So that's why I'm casting this as an interpolation problem. All right, so I'll let you look through all that. Here's just a definition of what we mean by mean squared error. 
And if you've ever looked into fitting a line to data, this is this is the way you kind of do it. We just take the difference, we square them, and then we average out. The nice thing about this is so if there's n data points, we divide by n. And that way, depending on whether your data set is large or small, or you're looking at a subset of your data set or the entire data set, your MSE can be you know, roughly the same. And so I'm always going to prefer losses that have this kind of averaging property in them. All right, and so we're going to train this through gradient descent. And if you don't know what gradient descent is, that's totally okay. That just means we're going to try to minimize a function by kind of going in the downhill direction. So I drew a picture here, and I put in a link. Actually, if you click on that gradient descent, I've got a much longer lesson on gradient descent. And we're later on, we're actually going to follow down into that lesson. But for today, I'm just kind of keeping it in terms of pictures and things. So let's say we want to minimize some function, meaning we want to find the x that gives you the minimum f if this is some function f of x f of x so it's not the same i know i used the letter f for the activation function but this f is just any old function which has a minimum and in this case i'm just using a parabola and so we're going to start with some initial guess for x which in this case i used x equals minus five so f of minus five is up there and so these are a bunch of different attempts to find the minimum of x all parameterized by a learning rate so you'll see this word learning rate. Learning rate is really essentially the uh, controls the size of the step you take. So we're going to start up here and then we're going to kind of look whether going X to the right or X to the left, if that gets us downhill and we're going to evaluate that by taking the derivative, but actually we're not going to take the derivative. We're going to let PyTorch or some other package, we're going to use PyTorch, take that derivative for us because in general, it's going to be lots and lots of derivatives going together. It's not just going to be a simple derivative of a parabola, right? And so think of the uh, learning rate, which a lot of times people will write with the letter alpha or maybe the letter eta. Tiny, tiny steps like these kind of yellow orange ones. You take lots and lots of tiny steps, but it actually and it'll get you closer to the minimum, but it won't get you all the way. And so after a certain number of iterations, I don't know how many I did, but it doesn't go any farther. You need to keep on going and do way more to get to the bottom, right? And then similarly, alpha equals 0.8. This is so big that on the first step, you go all the way across to the other side. And uh, actually, if alpha had been one or greater, we would have ended up like even farther away and we would have gotten an instability. But some kind of right value of alpha where you take big enough steps to kind of get to where you want to go, but not so big that you're going too far. Choosing the right learning rate can be a bit of an art. And actually, since we're using fast AI, fast AI comes with this algorithm called learning rate finder. It suggests a learning rate for you. And so for today, rather than go into a really, really deep discussion about choosing learning rates, I'm just justifying the use of the word learning rate and what it is. It's the size of the step that we take essentially as we're going farther down. All right, just another picture. So this is supposed to be like a surface. This is what we might call the loss surface, uh, where say these are like some mountains in light color, and then there's a valley down here. And we start from some point over here, and then we go downhill. And you'd think, oh, well, if the minimum is over here where it's dark, what we'd really like to do is go straight across. But it turns out that because of this shape, we go downhill this way first, really fast, and then we're kind of stuck in this long sort of canyon in a way. And it takes us a lot longer to really get to the minimum. And that's something that happens a lot in deep learning is you can get some dimensions where things optimize quickly and then others where they optimize really slowly. Now you'll also hear about functions that are what we call non-convex. And in general, we're going to be dealing with non-convex functions. And so convex means it's always curved the same way, as opposed to like this function, which curves kind of this way and then the other way and then back up. And so this one has more than one minimum. And the gradient descent algorithm kind of guarantees that you'll eventually find a minimum, but you might find not the best minimum. You might not find the global minimum. So here's a couple examples where in this case for the uh, yellow and the uh, green, they get kind of stuck in a local minimum, whereas taking a bigger step, we end up kind of jumping over that. And you may wonder, well, what's the right answer to use for that? Turns out there's a whole host of schemes for this made by very smart people. And we're gonna use some of their optimi optimization schemes. In fact, today we're gonna use a scheme called Atom, 
which is really robust in a lot of different situations. So um, actually what happens when you go to many, many dimensions, like essentially for us, every weight of every neuron in every layer, so hundreds of weights, thousands, millions of weights, each one of those is going to end up being a dimension in our optimization problem. And when you have that many dimensions, you actually tend not to get this local minimum thing as much. You tend to get a lot more of this getting stuck in some kind of long, narrow valley where it takes a long time to get closer to the minimum. It's a big area of optimization research. And so we're just starting to scratch the surface here. Okay. So we're going to model a function and we're going to make kind of a case study. So this is an AI ethics flavor. So we're going to do something involving people. And uh, rather than grab real healthcare data, what I've done is I've made up a function and then we can manipulate the function, but it's supposed to kind of simulate uh, some real data. So let's pretend that um, we're going to want to model your risk of death by some certain age, you know, say 50 or something like that. I know, right? I'm almost 50. I'll just confess that right now. All right. Uh, so there may be all kinds of things that contribute, right, to your health and your risk, uh, whether you do risky behavior, what your eating habits are like, maybe how you drive, uh, where you live, um, health outcomes for members of your family. And honestly, a lot of that information is probably out there, whether you want it to be or not. There are these people called data brokers that will buy and sell the data that's on you, and they will get it from Facebook or other websites or whatever you've got. Um, and interestingly, this notion of modeling risk of death goes way, way back to the beginning uh, of statistics to Francis Galton, who um, we'll talk about him uh, a lot as we go on in this course. He's the father of statistics. He's also the father of eugenics. And he is the, the guy that invented this idea of making up a game uh, that's going to appeal to your ego and narcissism just to get data on you. And he famously at uh, one of the world's fairs, he made all these games for people to come in and play to test their strength and um, investigate their height and whatnot. And really what it was, it's like the, the Facebook uh, questionnaires, like which Harry Potter character are you, where they're learning things about you, uh, but sort of entertaining you as you go. And Galton was the guy that did this because he was really interested. He wrote to the Institute of Actuaries. He's like, hey, we need to do better um, life insurance risk assessment. So we need to get more data on people. So really, this history of getting data goes way, way, way back. And by the way, I've got a Galton board, which is uh, super fun. It's one of these little things where the balls go in and then they they come out and they form. Oh, well, this thing flip over. Yeah, it forms a... Uh, a normal distribution, which is fun. So that's on my desk. You can come to my office. Um, yeah, we can say more about this later on, right? So um, risk assessment, insurance, the actuaries, this is all hundreds of years in the making, very sophisticated mathematical modeling, um, people with degrees in statistics that really understand how this goes on. You can get an advanced degree in actuarial science. Um, yeah, actuaries are typically highly trained and highly paid, but now we've got machine learning. So throw all that out the window. We're just going to grab data on people. We're going to fit some model and we're going to disrupt. We're going to disrupt the insurance industry. All right. You have to understand I'm being sarcastic about the, the trends in the technology world. Uh, but this is something that people, uh, if they kind of have done are doing and are in the process of doing and then there it's also regulations about this because you can't just rip people off uh for insurance in certain parts of the world in the us that's another thing i put in a little link on um some things about like actual predictive modeling by real people if you want to read up on that um so yeah uh it turns out as i mentioned you, we could take all this different data about you and then just kind of throw it into the machine learning algorithm and hope that it figures out something interesting. But um, it actually works out better sometimes if you, actually in many cases, if you use less data. And so rather than all the data we might have on you or me, we're just going to pick out two features, okay? And so um, we're going to say uh, 
calorie intake. I've got a, a typo here. And again, this is not all right. I'm not a actual scientist of this kind of thing. This is just something semi plausible that will give us some data to fit to explore the uh, um, the properties. So something that's kind of U shaped. So like if you're not eating any calories, that's probably bad for you. If you're eating tons and tons of calories, that's bad. But somewhere in the middle is probably good. Not that we're going to try to find that middle. It's not an op. I guess for you and me, that might be an optimization problem. But for us, this is just going to be some function. And then similarly, we'll look at exercise and we'll say, look, if maybe if you never exercise, maybe your risk is higher. Or if you're exercising 24 seven, maybe that's not so great. But if you're exercising in moderation, then you maybe have less of a risk. And the point of all this was just to make some kind of function that has some interesting shape that we can try to fit. And then we can control it by adding noise. Because one of the interesting things we can do is look at how models fit in the presence of noise. And so I'm realizing now I've been talking for a while. Um, I'm not going to talk you through every single little thing on here, but I want to get you through some of the, the big stuff. So we just checked, we installed our stuff that we need and we're importing. Hopefully everything will import okay. Let me make uh, the font even bigger. All right, everything fit. And so the data. So I've got this function gen DF. Now DF stands for data frame. That's a pandas thing. Pandas is basically the uh, Python version of Excel. It's kind of like spreadsheets. I know data scientists are offended by what I just said, but uh, pandas, data frames, it's like an array, it's like a spreadsheet. So data frame, and this is just going to generate, I just made some stuff up. You don't need to really worry about the specifics of this. All this is just to give us a function. Honestly, what I did was I generate tons and tons of points on a regular grid, and then I throw out 95% of those points. So in a random way, so that here's a picture coming up. Yeah. So this is now, these are our data points and you can see it kind of has a shape to it. But um, it's not the the regularness of the grid is not evident. It's, it kind of looks randomy, which is what I wanted. Now, right now, there's no noise. This actually, uh, actually, there is a smooth surface that all of these points lie on. But later on, we can add some noise. The reason I did it with no noise at first is so that we can kind of explore the training loss and the validation loss, and then when we add the uh, when when there's no noise, the validation loss and the training loss stay pretty close together. But then if when we add the noise, what we're going to see if we train a lot is the training, the noise, <coughs> the loss on the training set is going to keep going down as we train, whereas the loss on the validation set is going to go down and then it's going to start to go back up. So this is our data. And yeah, you can play with that, move that around. And if we wanted to, we could throw out, for example, we could throw out the exercise and just look at the calories, which is kind of like just projecting along one of these axes. And uh, some of this I wrote with that option, um, but actually everything else that's through here, we're going to use both of those features. So you don't really need to worry about that. Um, all right. And so, yeah, I'm not reading every single thing. We're going to do some raw PyTorch, and I am following some stuff by Zach Mueller, who uh, is going to be our speaker this coming Monday, which is going to be great on how to integrate uh, PyTorch and FastAI in a minimal kind of way. So we're going to get down, you're going to see some raw PyTorch stuff in just a bit. So um, yeah, I got this with exercise. Just leave that stuff, leave this stuff as it is. And we could, there's this thing in FastAI, it's called tabular data loaders. These guys made these things, but I'm going to hold off on that and say, you know what, let's make our own PyTorch data set. So there's a class called data set. And we can name our version of that, whatever we want. So I called it my data set, right? And this is just kind of following one of the tutorials. And so for a PyTorch data set, it, uh, it needs a couple things, all right? Well, when you call it, um, you pass in you know, the thing you want, which for us is going to be a data frame. And uh, these input columns, I'm using both of those. Yeah, don't worry about it. I ended up not, uh, this is just going to be both our data columns. We're always going to be using the calories and the exercise. And then uh, PyTorch data set, you need to have something so you can query how long the data set is. So there's a method called underscore underscore len. And uh, this gets used anytime you want to know the length of the data set, which is really just the length of the pandas data frame that we're passing in. And then it how uh, PyTorch data sets also have to have this thing get item. And if you want, 
um, we're going to pass in some index number to say, hey, give me the data at this point. And so that's all this thing does is it serves it up and it serves it as a PyTorch tensor so that it's all ready to go, ready to go and be used by PyTorch. And then there's this thing called batch size, which is important. And that's essentially how many data points we're going to send in at a time. And we can have larger batch, batch sizes or smaller batch sizes. And that's a whole other conversation that we'll have later on. For now, I just set it to five, okay? Because I wanted a multiple of five for our number of data points. We had 250 data points that works out well. All right, and then I have this, I make this little thing called DF to DLS. And so the DLS is the data loaders from uh, fast AI that you may remember. And so all this is, is we pass in a data frame, which is our data points, right? And um, we're just gonna shuffle the order of the rows. Shuffling is, is good. We're gonna, yeah, sampling does that, okay? And then we're gonna split it. We're manually gonna do this. In our previous lesson, we let fast AI do the split for us. We're gonna split this data frame up and we're gonna use the 80% of the data is gonna go to the training data set and the 20% is gonna go to the uh, validation data set. So I define, first I, I take the, the main data frame. I know there's data frame, there's data set, there's data loaders. Data frame is from pandas. We're gonna have, I'm just gonna make the data frame version for the training and the validation. And so for that, all I do is use slicing. So I define this thing, right? We take the total number of data points and and then multiply it by 0.8 and make it an integer. And so this is essentially the index of 80% of our data. So in the training data set, zero up to 80% of the data is all gonna go in the training. And then everything after that is just gonna go in the validation, right? And then I just do a couple of asserts just to check that we've got, we wanna have these as, um, this is a modulus operator. Just wanna make sure that the batch size divides evenly into this. And if not, you know, it sends an error message. And then we're just gonna convert those data frames into, PyTorch data set. So you'll notice my data set. So my data set, you pass in a data frame and stuff and don't worry about the input columns. I could have left that as it was. So uh, Val and then um, data loader is a thing that we can use for our, um, that's PyTorch, also data loader singular. And uh, that'll just convert the, um, yeah, the data set into a data loader. I know they're not quite the same thing, but they're very, very, very closely linked. And this is where we actually define what the batch size is. So the data loader, every time you say, hey, give me a new batch, it'll grab a batch of batch size from the data set, all right? And so we do that for training and validation. And then this is a fast AI thing, data loaders, and uh, we convert, we put both of those together and call it DLS. And so I call that uh, return DLS. And we could have hard coded all of this into just this, um, this cell of the notebook, but I've really gotten to the point of doing everything where I define a function and then I call the function because that way later on, as we go down, if I want to redo this, I don't have to type in all this stuff over again. I can just pass in a new data frame into DF to DLS and yeah, this code is already there. So anyway, shift enter yay and now we've got our data loaders now here we go behold we now have a pytorch this is a neural network model all right it's called a module so nn.module is the pytorch class that we use whenever we're defining neural networks there is a, a preset called sequential that we can use so you can call it whatever you want i called it class net but you could rename this to anything else but it has to be pytorch module and then two parts to every uh model class so model module i don't know why they didn't uh, model models are made up of modules and a model is a module um, we need an init and we need a forward all right so init is how we set things up and so this is kind of where we tell it it's almost like we're allocating memory in a way even though it's python but it's kind of like we're setting up the architecture usually. So we're gonna have a couple layers. We're gonna have our input. Uh, these are really the weights, honestly. These are the weights that are gonna connect the dimensions of the input to the dimensions of the hidden layer. It's really, it's just a big old matrix. And um, we haven't talked about matrix multiplication in detail yet, but really this is just gonna be a matrix of weights. And uh, yeah, we define a few things here. You're also supposed to have this super init thing. 
So some of this is boilerplate. This stuff we're passing in just parameters of what we want. Define a couple layers. And then the real uh, part where it actually gets used is in forward. So whenever we want to train the network, whenever we want to do forward inference, then that's this forward thing. And we always have to pass in a self when you're inside a class, a self. And then X is going to be some inputs. And we could have called it anything we want, but X is kind of handy. And so what we're going to do in this particular model, this is a really simple model, we'll do more later on. We're going to um, run this through, so I called it layer in, um, and then that's going to compute. This is essentially going to be our hidden layer. This is going to be the weighted sum part. And then we're going to run it through an activation, which, so there's this F dot, which is part of PyTorch, and then ReLU, which is the rectified linear unit thing. All right, and then we're going to take that and run it through the output layer. And we could we could also do another ReLU on there. we got a lot of options, but this is our simplest thing that we're going to do. All right, and for now, we're going to say, so hidden dim is the size, how many neurons we're going to have in our hidden layer. And so for starters, we're going to start with 15, which is not a lot. We could do lots more, but I want to keep things simple. And also, I'm going to do this torch manual seed just so that when we rerun it and we change things, we can know that it's because of what we changed, not because of do random stuff. And then we're going to define an instantiation or an instance of this class net with some stuff we pass in. And don't worry again about this uh, input in. This is always going to be two. It just works out to two. And we're going to tell it how many hidden dimensions we want. And I think it defaults to ah nothing. So it's a positional argument. So we could have left off the hidden dim equals and just passed in hidden dim. So then this thing, this net, that's going to be a PyTorch model. And that's what we're going to hook up with fast AI. You've now seen a PyTorch model. And they can get more complicated than this. Notice, actually, we haven't defined anything about gradients or doing gradient descent with this. But PyTorch, hello, kitty. PyTorch figures all this stuff out on its own. And I'm going to pause for just a second because my uh, co-pilot is having an issue. So let's pause. Yeah, 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 all right, yeah, she wanted to, Okay. Oh, hey, we've been recording this whole time. I paused the screen sharing, but um, not the recording. Great. So uh, obviously, I'm going to be a YouTube personality. Don't forget to uh, like and subscribe, and uh, we'll have a word from our sponsors later on. All right, moving on. Um, and I've got this thing here, which, yeah, there we go. All right, so PyTorch model, there it is. And we're gonna integrate with weights and biases or wand B. You don't need to do this, but uh, it's this great thing where you can track how your models are running. This is kind of like if you've heard of TensorBoard, TensorBoard can do this. There are various other systems for checking how things are going, but weights and biases is kind of neat and I've been wanting to integrate with us. So it's actually a company and a website and a software library and an API. So weights and biases, Wanbi, and it's just wanbi.ai. And so we can go there. And so in order to do this part of the lesson, I want you to sign up for a free account at weights and biases, Wanb. They also do education and outreach and they'll regularly do lessons and free classes online, like over Zoom and things for all kinds of other cool stuff. So, uh, and they are not sponsoring this. They're, I'm, we're using them. All right. And so I've put in some links for things on how to do this. But mainly what I want you to do is create yourself a Wand B account, Weights and Biases account, and then come back. And so as we go on, a couple things, we're going to install the uh, pip install Wand B. And previously I was using the uh, pipe grip minus V available. 
you can actually turn off lots and lots of messages from pip by this minus qqq so that's like quiet 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 and then we're going to do uh one b login so here we go so it's installing various things and then it's going to give us a little prompt to say log in okay so you can find your api key so what you want to do is click on there it takes you to a little spot and i'm already logged in in my browser to one b so we'll just copy this code and then we'll go back and then it's a little hard to see but there's actually you have to click on it but there's a little spot and we can paste that in and hit return and then we don't need to remember that and now we're good to go all right and so let's just check that we can import the wand b stuff hoist up the wand b sales as it were and now we're going to train the model okay and so this is our just the same stuff that we were doing before the opt function is uh, our optimizer method and we're going to leave this as it is adam is a really robust uh optimizer there are others that we can choose but this works out pretty well and here's our fast ai learner and we're going to define our loss function as the msc which in pytorch is called nn.msc loss and our app function is going to be that and then for our callbacks what we're going to do is we're going to use this one b callback which somebody wrote for fast ai and it turns out that um, the callback doesn't do this for you um, you're supposed to call one b init every time before you do something or else nothing works and so i would have loved it if one b init was built into the callback but it turns out that doesn't work you can give it a name or not if you don't give it a name then it'll become an uncategorized thing and so when we press run and we do this well, let's just do it all right so it says i'm logged in and it spits out some links so it's telling you where everything's going to go and so for example you can click on one of these i think i'm already there and i've got this thing okay uh yeah neural networks fit curves and it gives you these funny names unique names which right now there's nothing there because we haven't run it yet so um yeah there we go and now what we're going to do we're going to use the fast ai learning rate finder which is lr find and the actual number it's called valley for some reason and so we're going to grab that number the way the learning rate finder works is pretty interesting you can read about it we're not going to go into it right now we could have just guessed a number we could have guessed like 0.01 or something but um, we're going to use this number so that's the number that we're going to store in that variable and then here we go we're going to say 50 epochs now previously when we were doing the image stuff we only did like five epochs because we were starting from a pre-trained network what we had done was we downloaded this model called resnet that had already been trained on tons and tons and tons of images and all we needed to do is just kind of fine tune it on our set of images but in this case we defined a brand new model that no one's ever tried before no they have definitely tried models as simple before but there's no pre-initialization we just got random weights and so we're gonna have to run for a lot of epochs maybe 50 maybe 100 maybe a million kind of depends 50 is probably pretty good to get an idea but more than 10. And so um, we could have just hard coded the epochs there. And then it turns out also the wand B thing, you got to do wand B dot finish every time so that it knows that when you want to start again, it won't just keep continuing from your previous run. That was the problem I was having last night and earlier today. I didn't know about the wand B finish thing. So here we go. So we're going to watch a train and. Um, also, there's no accuracy metric. This is not a classification model. This is just trying to fit the loss. So we've got our training loss and our validation loss. And you can see that these numbers are going down, going down, going down, going down. And you can kind of look at the numbers going down, and that's okay. Or we can look at the graph. Now, <laughs> WANB actually gives you like a lot of information here. And it even draws these little kind of blocky pictures, which are kind of quaint. But the real stuff is, yeah, uh, if you click, so this is called Woven Salad 1. So if you go back to Woven Salad 1 and re-click, now we got a bunch of graphs and things. And the one that I'm mostly interested in, in fact, so many things, there's probably a way to say, don't give me all this information, just give me, for example, so you can click this little down thing. Yeah, here's a training loss, and somewhere validation loss is what I find most interesting. But yeah, there we go, there validation loss. 
right. And so as a function of, so this is not a function of epoch. It's not going up to 50. It's per step and step is per batch. So we have batches of five and we had 250 data points times 0.8 is however big the training data set is. And then that many steps. So if we don't like that, we can actually define our own graph. We can go up here to the little plus sign and say line plot. And instead of steps, we do epoch. And instead of that thing, we do valid loss. Yeah. Okay. And then where'd it go? There it is. And now we, okay. Uh, it disappeared. It's somewhere, somewhere on here. Great. That was, that was a good job. Wasn't it? Holly step. Oh, let's try one more time. We'll make it again. Line plot epoch or epic. Actually, I want that. And then I want validation loss. Should probably speed up this entire video. There we go. Epoch up to 50. Okay. So epoch rate is one pass through the whole data set. And so it looks like, you know, went down, went down, went down and kind of leveled off. And that's what you tend to see in many cases. Now I would love it if we could do like logarithmic can get, do we have, a, oh yeah, this little button log scale. I'm all about the log scale personally as a scientist. We'll talk about log scales at some point this semester. Don't worry about it for now. Most people just look at it this way. Uh, I think that's not as helpful, but we'll go on. All right, so there we go. All right, now, now we're gonna change some stuff around. So this is where the Wan B thing comes in. So that's woven salad. We're gonna run it again. And so, um, oh yeah, one other thing. So let's take a look at how our model interpolates between these points. So those are our points. And now in a slightly different color, that's what our model does. So we made up our model. Let's go back and, and look at our PyTorch model. PyTorch model has some a uh, couple linear layers and it's got the ReLU, which is like the, the angle thing. And so we get a certain number, I think 15. We did 15 in the hidden layer. So about 15 of these uh, kinks in various places. And some of them are actually like off the end of the graph where they're not helping us at all. And so, yeah, that's not the greatest thing in the world. And if we were to start from a new random initialization, we would probably get a different model there for this. But what we really need to do is make this model a little more expressive and then we can get some uh, better fit. So that's the next thing. Exercise one, add more neurons to the hidden layer. So it says scroll up, change the hidden dim, and then um, change it from 15 to something bigger. And so actually maybe a hundred. So I actually went ahead and did that here. I went ahead and redefined the net. So all you gotta do is just scroll back up and um, do, 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 do. back to the part which says train the model. Not all the way up there. We don't need to do the data sets. We don't need to do that. We're gonna train the model and we got the one B init. It's actually gonna give us instead of woven salad one, it's gonna give us a new name for a new run because we remember, yeah, so now this run's gonna be called Proud Blaze 2. And we have 100 neurons in the hidden layer instead. And we could use the same learning rate, but we got the learning rate finder, so we might as well, all right? That's actually a little different. That's smaller than it was before. And now let's fit. And one of the things we're gonna see, and actually, yeah, in this I didn't save it, but these numbers are smaller than the previous round. They, we got an extra zero on there. So we're getting a better fit. As we go on and so when that's all done that's going to save to 1b and we can look at our fit again and now check this out see how much better it fits because we have more neurons there's still some like angular flat shapes to it and that's again because we're using that uh relu function which is made it's piecewise linear mathematicians would say but we're doing pretty well right we could probably sell this to someone on the internet, All right? Okay, so um, now let's go back to our wand B weights and biases thing. And now we'll notice we got proud blaze and woven salad and together we're seeing how they perform differently. And so the loss on the validation set is lower. In fact, we could have actually kept on going because this thing didn't flatten out yet. And uh, so we could have run to like a hundred epochs or so and run it till it flattens out or until it bottoms out and starts going back up. But this is a neat thing about uh, Wan B, and this is why they sell their services to companies and things. You can have like hundreds and hundreds of runs as you're trying to figure out what to do for your model. And you can kind of look at everything. And there's a lot more that you can look at 
in all this. You can actually look at the insides of your model itself. You can look at gradients. We're not going to do that today in the interest of time. I'm just mainly kind of showing you this tool so that as the semester goes on, as we're training models and things, we can use weights and biases as a tool to help us understand what's going on with our system. Not that uh, the fast AI tools are bad, and there are there's some things we could plug in that are not weights and biases that we give as graphs. But instead of just looking at the numbers and watch the numbers go down, a lot of times looking at the graph, you can learn more. Okay, so that was exercise one. So I'm not gonna do every single other thing here. Uh, exercise two is add more layers. So what we've done is I made a list. Instead of just a hidden layer with one dimension, hidden dims was one number. Now we're gonna make a list called hidden dims where each number is the dimensions of that hidden layer. And so we can pass in like hidden dims, like 40, 40 neurons, 40 neurons, 40 neurons. So like three hidden layers of 40 neurons feeding into each other. And then um, this is our model now. And so all I did, this is just ordinary Python, okay? So some of this was our uh, PyTorch, right? And this stuff was the same. I went ahead and said, look, maybe we don't even wanna use ReLU every time. So rather than hard code f.relu, I made up a variable called self.activation. And if we want, we could change this to f.sigmoid or f.tanh or whatever else PyTorch has. In fact, we wanna look at uh, PyTorch activation functions and there will be a page full of pytorch um yeah i think it's torch.nn.functional yeah because functional and f and so for example we look at relu nonlinear activation function yeah and they've got all these different options for all the different things people want to try all right so any of those so rather than hard code it i just made up a variable so instead of having f passing x through relu in uh, the forward now it just goes through activation. And then uh, it turns out with PyTorch, you can't just define an ordinary list. This is a list, but you have to call it module list. But otherwise, just think of it as like a couple brackets. I learned this myself, all right? I tried making this just an ordinary list. And then we just used make the list longer and longer with append. I just appended some layers. And then since these are matrix multiplies, just made it so that the matrices work out. Okay, and we're gonna talk about matrix multiplication and how to get the dimensions to line up uh, pretty soon. But for now, this is just gonna make a bunch of different layers, feed them all into each other. And you can feed in more and more and more and more if you want, right? And then the forward is we're just gonna run through all the different layers and um, we're gonna take the, the input, run it through the layer. We're gonna make that the new input for the next layer until we get to the very, very end. So at the very end, we're not gonna run the activation function. Um, that was kind of because, like, let's say we run the activation function as ReLU on the very end. That means none of our numbers that come out of the model will be less than zero. But, okay, which actually works out for the case of this um, disrupting the insurance industry model because everything was between zero and one. But um, anyway, I, I just chose, I didn't want that, right? So this is a different model. And notice I called it Net2. Came it really interesting name. Right. And so I'm not going to do this for you, but you can run this all over again. All right. And then take a look at that. Okay. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that, but you run it again. And actually this time, instead of having you scroll way back up, I kind of had it as a repeat so that you can kind of compare the results of this run with the previous run. And I even put in that little torch manual seed zero so that it'll kind of, I don't know if it really matters because now we got a bunch of different random layers anyway, but there it is. And so you'll run that and you'll get a different set of results and that'll show up on your weights and biases page. And you're gonna end up with three different graphs for that. And we can plot what it looks like. There's probably a way to turn off the run summary if we don't care to see it, but you'll get some new lost surface, which should be even probably more wiggly than what you had, maybe not. Now we've still been using smooth data without noise. So, the next exercise, oh yeah, by the way, this is just a screenshot, a massive screenshot from three different runs. This was the first run with just the one layer and the 15 neurons, and then the red line was 100 neurons in one layer, and then the purple line was um, the multiple uh, three-layer model of 40, 40, 40, and notice it actually started higher, but it went down lower, a little bit of wiggling down there, um, but so this got us a lower loss. Okay, so then 
Exercise four, here's where things get really interesting. Add noise to the data. So when you add noise, and I'm suggesting like 0.15, so instead of fitting a smooth surface, this actually doesn't quite fit. And what can happen is we can get overfitting where the training data adjusts the, the surface so that it fits each and every single little data point really, really well in the training data, but the validation data, because of the noise, it's not on that surface. And what we'll tend to see is um, we'll tend to see our training loss and our validation loss will go down, but then the training loss will keep going down. The validation loss will either plateau while the training loss keeps going down. And in many cases, we'll have the validation loss start to come back up. And that's what we call overfitting. Now, uh, Fast AI actually makes it a little hard to do overfitting because of some of the defaults that are built into their models. They've made their models better over time. They do some things like it's called weight decay and stuff, which um, I may have to issue you a new version of this notebook where I turn off the weight decay so that we can make we can force these models to overfit. You don't want your models to overfit in general. That's going to give you poor generalization, but. I wanted to show it for this demo. So what I really love is if you can go back and do this, and then when it comes time to generate the surface, you'll get a surface that's really crinkly and wiggly. All right, now something else I want you to do as a way to just experiment really fast is some of you got a chance to check out Andrew Carpathy's uh, Convnet JS which is not PyTorch, it all runs in the browser, but he's got some layers of a neural network. So he's got a couple layers with the ReLU and the sigmoid activation. And then he's got these data points and you can just click and add data points and watch, watch how it fits. And you can try to make it really hard for the model and give it, give it like really crazy data that like goes up and down super fast. And you'll notice it doesn't do super great. But as you, what I kind of want you to do is like we did a couple weeks ago, mess around, mess around with adding different layers, different numbers of layers, different activations, and kind of see what you can get this model to do and not do. And the reason that I'm suggesting that you do it in this convent thing is that it's running super fast and you can just plot the data points and, and mess around a little more easily. You can do that in this notebook as well. It just take you a little longer of scrolling up and down and stuff like that. So I say spend a lot of time on this. I want to see if you can get a really crinkly overfitting on here um, and then mess around with that, okay? That's not the actual assignment. So I'm still writing up the assignment. And what it's going to be essentially is you're going to define a PyTorch model based on the examples that we have above. And then we'll check to see that it trains, right? So probably have that ready um, early to mid next week. But for now, walking through this is what you need to do. So I'm going to stop recording there. And yeah, hope you have some fun. And that was not stop recording. That was stop share. So I think I'm still in Zoom. This is why I'm never going to be a YouTube star. All right. Yeah. Smash that subscribe button. Press a like. I'm just kidding. And uh, we'll see you later.